everyone. Happy Fed Day. It's Wednesday, December 14th. We have Sam Burns from Mill Street Research helping us unpack what we learned today. The market chopping around net negative, but a lot of noise finishing the day right around 4,000. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts. The technical analysis toolkit is designed to help us navigate uncertain times by focusing on the message the markets provide back to us in the form of price, breadth, momentum, sentiment, trend, all of these tools and indicators that we talk about through the course of our show every weekday. Interesting day today, of course, is the Fed, uh, the big focus after the inflation data uh, yesterday. Today, we have the Fed meeting sort of drifting higher through the course of the day, but really pushing to the downside uh, after the uh, numbers came out during the uh, Powell press conference, a lot of noise. End of the day, the S&P, I feel like is a, in a lot of ways, is right back where it started, right around 4,000. No real clear next step, I think, in terms of the short-term movements, although the major average is certainly finishing in the red. We have a lot of charts to review, and we'll get to those very quickly. I did want to let you know about the upcoming schedule. Great guest today. We have Sam Burns from Mill Street Research, a really good uh, strategist uh, with a macro perspective, so perfect for today to help us sort of uh, keep a focus, a proper focus on the long term. Tomorrow, we have Hema Reddy, who is a specialist in GAN and Fibonacci analysis, and it uses a lot of tools that I am familiar with and a lot that I don't use very often. I think it's always helpful to bring in some different perspectives. We are going to be on a holiday schedule for the next two weeks through the holiday season. We're going to be back live with you the first week in January, but I did want to let you know we're working on a special series that's going to start running this coming Monday called the Top 5 Charts of 2022. I will go through five charts every day, Monday through Friday. I'll unveil one of them, talk about why it's important, how to think about them, what they might tell us about the conditions going into next year. Let's continue on our show today with the market recap. A uh, big focus, of course, on the Federal Reserve, uh, bringing basis point, or excuse me, bringing rates down, bringing the, uh, the Fed funds rate, uh, target rate down about 50, or up about 50 basis points, continuing this string of rate hikes and finishing the year off strong, but all, uh, of course, a focus on what this tells us about uh, about the uh, conditions going forward. What happened with the markets? A little later in the show, we have a segment called Don't Fight the Federal. We'll focus particularly on some of the uh, results of the Fed meeting today and some of the takeaways, I think, thinking about uh, rates and the fixed income markets. But the averages themselves, the S&P down 0.6%. That's pushing us just below 4,000. It got as low as 39.70 and bounced a, a lot around uh, during the uh, during the press conference. The end of the day, the beginning of the press conference and the end of the comp press conference were right about at the same level. That might be an important takeaway, right? Did we really learn anything new? I, I don't think so. I don't. I mean, from what I could tell, the language was not dramatically different. It was sort of a, you know, continuing to look down the road and continuing to focus on inflation. At the end of the day, the S&P went from, you know, positive for the day before the number came out to uh, a bit negative. The Nasdaq composite, by the way, down 0.8%, mid caps and small caps all down as well. Today, yet another day where the S&P, the Nasdaq and the VIX move in, uh, in the same direction. Common, uh, you know, takeaway or common way of thinking about volatility, particularly the VIX, is stocks move higher, volatility tends to go down. Stocks move lower, volatility tends to increase. And generally speaking, that's because people don't sort of gently, calmly, in a rational way, panic when things get worse. They tend to, you know, it's a very emotional decision. As a result, volatility tends to increase in down phases versus up phases. But what's happened a lot of times here, and particularly today and yesterday, is you've had the S&P and the VIX move up together and move down together. And I'll show you a chart of that a little later in the show uh, today. So remember, those are not directly connected. They're related, uh, but uh, you're seeing volatility actually decrease while the major averages finished the day down. Interest rates moving around quite a bit. At the end of the day, the 10-year yield didn't change much from yesterday. We started the day around 350, uh, or yesterday's close around 350, same place we ended the, uh, the day here. 
Uh, bond prices using the TLT up about 0.4%. The dollar index moving down by about half a percent. Uh, I was asked earlier today in an interview about the dollar index, uh, just thinking about 2022. And I, and, uh, and, and I think the dollar index has been a fascinating way of thinking about uh, the overall conditions in the uh, in the market, the macro conditions uh, this year. One of the big changes, what we call a change of character, is that rotation from a bullish dollar environment through most of this year to more of a bearish dollar environment, more of a very weaker dollar environment, uh, which is giving room for risk assets to uh, to move higher. Commodities mixed, to be honest with you, gold down by about a quarter of a percent, silver using the SLV up about 0.7 percent. Uh, crude oil prices moving higher. The energy sector sort of in the middle of the road uh, relative to the 11 S&P sectors. We'll talk about the other sectors here in a uh, in a moment. I did want to highlight the fact that Bitcoin got all the way up to over 18,300 uh, before the, uh, the, uh, the, the Fed meeting came off quite a bit and finished off more where we finished the day yesterday, uh, just around uh, 17,800. Ether settling in just above 1,300. And that's coming off of 1,350 uh, a little bit earlier today. Well, just look at the chart of the S&P 500. Just think about what this overall, you know, th this week, again, a very noisy week in terms of uh, potential catalysts, right? We have the inflation number yesterday. We have the Fed meeting today. You know, if you take a step back and look at what has actually changed, I would say from a, um, you know, from a, from a technical perspective, what's happened is we have tested a key resistance level around 4,100. And we tested that first at the end of November. We've now tested this again uh, yesterday. Both times now, we have uh, met 4,100 and failed to break above that. And that, that is more and more becoming a significant level. I was always taught once is chance, twice is a coincidence, three times is a pattern. That was a shorthand way of reminding you that the more you test a level, the more meaningful it is. And, and it, the more it is a it is a level that, for whatever reason, is uh, is starting to define the uh, the trend and define the conditions behind uh, the the market. So as we've traded up to 4,100 and failed, all of a sudden that that seems to be sort of a key level, right? Until we break above 4,100, this tells you that you know we we have limited upside uh, using just classic approaches of support and resistance. Now on top of that, these were also the two times we've attempted to break above the 200-day moving average. Now you remember back in August we rallied right up to the 200-day and failed. This uh, last couple of weeks, if you think about it, has been two additional attempts to get above the 200-day moving average. We've closed above it once or twice and gone back below it. And a couple of days later, uh, here in the first attempt in late November, uh, this time we actually didn't close above it. We traded above it yesterday, but closed back below. And today, once again, following through uh, to the downside. On top of that, these highs around 4,100, these days here also line up beautifully with this green uh, dashed line, which is a uh, trend line connecting the highs in 2022. Take the January high, the March high, the August high, that lines up magnificently with the highs in the last uh, couple of weeks. So overall, are, is there a scenario where the market moves meaningfully higher through year end? Absolutely 100% possible. Is it is it is it required that the S&P is able to get above these levels, particularly 4,100, and complete that rotation? 100% true. So I think you have some clear overhead resistance to pay attention to. So far in the last couple of weeks, it appears like those levels have been uh, have been reached, and there's been not enough follow through to indicate uh, upside potential uh, from there. Be interesting to see, of course, how this uh, how this week plays out. Here we're now in the seasonally strongest part of the year. In, uh, in December, December tends to be a pretty strong month for stocks. If you look back at the historical averages, would indicate higher likelihood of moving higher than lower uh, here in the short term. Now, when you look at sectors here, to, just to finish off our market recap, you look at the sector movements, only one of the S&P sectors, it appears to have closed in the green and it's healthcare. The XLV finished up about 0.2%. Consumer staples really close. I ended up down uh, just below zero. Utilities uh, earlier in the day were the top performing sector. And it was interesting to see as the market was moving higher going into the uh, the, the Fed announcement at two o'clock Eastern, utilities are actually the number one sector coming out of the open and for much of the uh, of the morning. What underperformed communication services? We actually highlighted that sector yesterday as a sector that has been certainly in a long-term downtrend and sort of reverting back to that larger trend for 2022 today with communication services and financials both down about 1.3% for the day. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Sam Burns. We'll see you in a minute.
Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It is a pleasure to have you join us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple of quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Sam Burns. First off, we welcome your questions. We had a great mailbag segment on Tuesday's show of this week. We'll do it again at the end of the week on Friday, our last mailbag of 2022. So get your questions in because we'd love to answer your question live on the air. Our email is the best way to get your questions to us, The Final Bar at StockCharts.com. We're also on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions and hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also go to StockChartsTV.com. All of these great guest discussions and interviews, fantastic experts like Sam Burns, like Larry Williams, like Martin Pring, Miss Schneider, uh, boy, Tom, uh, uh, um, who was it like Greg Schnell, uh, Tom Boley, and many others, all are available for free at stockchartstv.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Sam Burns. Sam is the founder of Mill Street Research, coming to us from the Boston area. He's been a frequent guest on the show, always brings a good big picture perspective. Sam, how are you? And welcome back. I'm good. Uh, thanks for having me back on, Dave. It's good to see you. We've got obviously a big day today with the Fed and uh, and everything. At the end of the day, we're always trying to make sense of things and, and how what we saw today fits into the big picture. And I appreciate you bringing some uh, longer term charts to help us think of it. We're starting with sentiment. Can you talk us through these uh, these three data series and what they tell you? Sure. This kind of gives the, the backdrop of where we are in terms of sentiment uh, for stocks, bonds and the dollar. So I like to look at a lot of, you know, kind of cross asset influences, uh, to kind of corroborate what's going on uh, in, in terms of price. And we definitely saw a, a lot of pessimism going through about mid-October. I uh, got extremely low readings on the on the percentage of bulls out there. And now that's starting to come back up for equities. So coming off of a, a big you know, long-term low in, in, in uh, sentiment is usually a good sign for equities. That's usually a good setup for, you know, potentially for further gains. We're certainly far from any kind of uh, uh, excessively high optimism. And the same is true to, to some degree in bonds. Uh, we're starting to see that come off of extreme lows as uh, the bond market starts to get a little more comfortable with the end of the Fed tightening cycle, uh, potentially approaching uh, you know maybe Q1 next year. And then the reverse of all that has been the dollar, where that the dollar has been a risk-off currency. People get nervous uh, and see the Fed raising rates, they buy the dollar, and now that's starting to come off, and you're starting to see the extremely bullish sentiment in the dollar uh, reverse back down again. When you think about the overall condition, Sam, uh, you know, obviously the the strong dollar has been, you know, one of the key stories in 2022 and, you know, other asset classes, uh, equities, bonds, gold have struggled to materialize any sort of meaningful gains. How important is a weak dollar going forward if you're bullish on stocks here? Is that a must have or a nice to have as you think about these, uh, the relationship of these asset classes? I think at this point, it's probably a, a nice to have for a weaker dollar. I think a stable dollar is, is mm. most important. Uh, you don't want to see the dollar getting you know stronger and stronger like it was for most of this year, uh, because that really just you know makes the risk off case and, and tells you that uh, uh, not only are investors worried, but that uh, you know corporate profits might be at risk for U.S. companies. So I think uh, you know just some stability would be fine. Uh, a little bit weaker dollar would be fine. Um, I think the you know the stock market likes you know stability more than anything else in that regard. Mm. I think once the Fed starts to become less of a, a major driver, uh, the dollar will probably also become less of a major driver as well. Yeah, that's a great point, uh, Sam. Your second chart, by the way, is talking about uh, style performance, really, right? Looking at growth versus value. Talk us through what this tells you about the conditions here. Well, you know, looking at the four major style indexes here from the Russell, I think um, you know the key thing for the year to date returns, and certainly even recently has been that it's been value that's been doing well um, and growth that's been struggling. And that's that's still the case now. Uh, and we also see that, uh, I also see that in the earnings revisions data that I look at, uh, where a lot of the growth sectors, particularly the large cap growth sectors, uh, have the more negative earnings revisions relative to the value sectors. So there's a, a fundamental support for these relative returns that you see here. And, uh, and certainly large cap value seems to be holding up best. I think that could continue a while longer. Uh, I think those kind of you know energy, financials, some of the industrials, those sectors are uh, are the areas that I like best and that have better relative earnings estimate uh, support. And uh, those are the the kind of areas that should probably do best in an environment of you know rising rates, slowing economic growth, you know, worries about uh, recession next year. Uh, people don't want necessarily want to chase the high growth stocks um, and uh, the expensive stuff. They want stuff that where there's less risk of, of disappointment. I think that's what you're seeing here. 
It's been an interesting theme in uh, in 2022, Sam. I, I I don't know if it's a surprise, but how much uh, the financial sector has struggled, right? Give, given a rising rate environment, I would, if I knew that was going to happen all through the course of the year, I probably think banks are a pretty decent bet. And at times that's been the case, but overall it's it's been sort of a disappointment. What would you need to see differently going into next year to make that a sector worth sort of following higher? Yeah, no, I, I do I like financials now. It's one of the overweights in my sector work. Um, partly because their earning decimal revisions have been holding up you know, much better. Um, and I think the fact that rates have risen has helped the lending margins for a lot of banks. So uh, from a fundamental standpoint, uh, they're, they're OK. And, and credit you know, defaults and things are still uh, fairly low. Um, so I think they've got some fundamental tailwinds. Uh, but yeah, it's hard to compete sometimes with uh, things like energy or some of the other areas mm. that had you know, much bigger moves and, uh, th this year. I think as as energy comes in and uh, the inflation story and the Fed kind of stabilizes, I think you know financials could hold up relatively well, both because they're a value sector and because the uh, you know kind of the backdrop from interest rates uh, is actually net supportive for them. When you uh, you know obviously we have it's Fed Day today, we have the Fed meeting. Uh, a lot of volatility is as expected. I think at the end of the at the end of the day, when uh, during the press conference leading into it, at the end of the day, a lot of choppiness and no. Big significant move, uh, higher or lower, I would argue, right? When you look at, at at the charts of of the major averages, what did you hear today? Or when you're thinking, looking forward, how does the uh, activities of the Fed it, going into the first and second quarter? How does that inform sort of your thinking about growth versus value and leadership? Yeah, I think to, you know today was an example of where uh, the market more or less knew what was going to happen in terms of the 50 basis point rate hike, and a lot of the commentary that came along with it. Uh, was not really a surprise. Um, and I think the market has gotten a little bit more comfortable with the idea that they can kind of fade the Fed a little bit in the sense that uh, the Fed has to maintain a certain message, a certain hawkish viewpoint uh, to keep you know financial conditions from easing too much, um, certainly from a perception standpoint, and make it look like they're, you know, they're on the case. Uh, but the market sees that inflation is slowing and that uh, the longer term interest rates have already come in some. And so I think that's making equities a little more comfortable making people willing to buy equities, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna go back to the small cap growth, super volatile stocks that were so popular you know, early last year. I think it means that you're gonna have more uh, you know, leadership from you know, large caps and value stocks where uh, you know, investors can be comfortable in an environment of slowing growth, which I think is what's gonna be the kind of the characteristic for next year. It's not gonna be high inflation and rising rates. It's gonna be uh, slowing growth, slowing inflation, and less of a Fed headwind uh, in 2023. I think that's how markets are starting to position for right now. Sam, that was a magnificent summary of where we're at and how to make sense of a, a noisy day like today with the, with the Fed meeting. Listen, great to see you again. Have a fantastic holiday. Uh, stay uh, stay uh, well there in the snowy season in Boston, and we'll see you in the new year, all right? Thanks very much, Dave. Appreciate it. That's Sam Burns. Sam's the chief strategist, the founder at Mill Street Research in the Boston area. We had we had a lot of fun before the show talking about exchanging war stories about experiencing uh, snowy uh, snowy winters in the Boston area. I love it. If you listen to that last, my, what I was excited to ask Sam about was just you know how to think about uh, the Fed meeting because I think there's so much of a focus on the short-term signal, right? And a lot of focus during the press conference about the volatility. And again, if you're a short-term trader, that makes a ton of sense. But for me, I'm always trying to think about the bigger picture. What did we really learn? What are the incremental changes in what we're seeing? And I thought that take uh, about, and particularly uh, Sam's second chart there, looking at growth versus value and the idea that going forward, large cap value is a place to see leadership. Talk about a very different environment. Imagine the market going higher and it's not the FANG stocks that are leading it, not small cap growth, but banks and industrial companies. It's sort of the larger blue chip types of uh, of, of stocks in those uh, sectors. Really, really interesting and a great take there, as always, from Sam Burns at Mill Street Research. We need to continue our show today with the next segment, Don't Fight the Fed. I love Sam's uh, summary there at the end. I just want to look a little bit in more detail about how some of these markets were performing going into the Fed announcement, how they performed coming out of that, and then take a step back and think about some of the uh, the longer term trends that uh, that we can make uh, that we can make sense of. You know, I was interviewed earlier today. Uh, our friends at Forex Analytics, Dale Pinkard and Blake Morrow and others, uh, who it's been a pleasure to uh, to collaborate with more and more in 2022, and I hope we're able to do so uh, in the new year as well. Uh, we were talking about just the overall interest rate environment and and uh, and thinking about you know how to describe 2022. What are the charts that help you make sense of what's happened? And as I'm preparing for my uh, year-end specials, uh, one of the charts will probably have something along the lines of the chart we're looking at right here, which is the 10-year uh, interest rate, right? The 10-year treasury yield. 
The idea with this is you're, you know, you're thinking about the overall conditions. And when you look at market history going back for the last 5, 10, 20 years, it's been a story of you know falling rates for for the p- first part of that, and then more recently, it's been uh, consistently low rates. In in some ways, maybe absurdly low rates, right? Unrealistically low rates. Uh, now, as we see inflation coming out of control, then the Fed has to raise rates to sort of uh, address those inflationary pressures. But if you look at the chart of the uh, of the ten year yield, look at how going into a uh, year end twenty twenty one, right, twelve months ago, we're sort of stable, right. And if you look at the ten year yield in June of twenty one versus the ten year yield in December of twenty one, about the same, right. Rates didn't, you know, rates fluctuated. Certainly, we moved up and down, but at the end of the day, it was right around the same, right around one and a half percent. From there, two thousand twenty two, so much change, right. It was like it was like a, a flip of a switch. From December of 21 to January of 22, where rates are going higher, bonds, of course, are selling off, which is related to that. Equities, generally speaking, are selling off with the exception of energy, which just sort of ripped to the upside in the first half of the year. Um, Cryptocurrencies, right, went from being an incredible uptrend in 2021 to an incredible downtrend. And the dollar index, which had been going up, uh, certainly accelerated to, uh, to the upside. So I'm very curious and would be interesting to see if you get a similar dramatic change of character going into uh, into the next year. But look at what this chart tells us about the conditions, right? When we see the uh, tenure yield going from 425 down to around 350 in a relatively short amount of time, this is about a two months where we've gone from making a new uh, new uh, new swing high and not just that, but over uh, eclipsing the 2018 high as well. Uh, you start to see uh, rates come down quite a bit, 75 basis points here in the last uh, in the last uh, eight weeks or so. So the question is, what's next, right? And I don't know if I heard anything uh, that would convince me differently. I think Sam and I were talking uh, before the show. Uh, I think Sam is certainly, uh, you know, has more of the viewpoint that rates can actually remain lower for longer, and that could certainly uh, and would certainly give uh, you know certain uh, sectors more of an opportunity to uh, to rally for sure. However, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I guess my take on it is I, I don't know if we've seen the top in the tenure yet uh, for this cycle. I, I would imagine rates go higher. You saw the 50, point, 50 basis point rate high today. That's, of course, the short end of the curve that we're talking about with uh, the Fed and, and changing that that end of it. But it tends to have a ripple effects. And this is all about expectations about where interest rates uh, will be headed. So I wouldn't be surprised if this goes higher. And if the pullback we've seen is similar to the pullback we saw in June, July, August, from there, we rotated higher. And that's where we made a new uh, high for the cycle. I'd be very curious going into the first quarter, if we get another reversal back to uh, to the upside. Uh, from a technical perspective, it's worth noting that bonds have rallied up to uh, their, their own 200-day moving averages, depending on what you look at it. The ag, for example, which we'll look at in a moment, is testing its 200-day from uh, below. The 10-year yield is well above its 200-day moving average. It's around three, uh, we'll call it 314 or so. So my general thinking is we stay above that 200-day moving average. And I, I could still argue that this is a, an uptrend and this is just the lower end of a channel that started in the beginning of 2022. And if you could take that channel further, that tells you in the first half of the year, that shows you where we could be, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, 455% even uh, even a little bit higher before the end is, uh, is seen. And then my question is, what does that do to leadership? And this second panel down is looking at value versus growth. I love uh, Sam Burns' chart, looking at the Russell, the large cap uh, growth and value, the small cap growth and value. See that clear differentiation with value outpacing growth by any stretch in 2022. And uh, and, and this ratio uh, of value over growth sort of uh, mirrors what uh, the conclusions that he was drawing here. Look how beautifully the um, the, the ratio of value over growth maps to uh, the 10-year yield, right? Rising rates tends to favor, be, be more attractive in general for value stocks, uh, and a downtrend in rates tends to be, um, uh, you know, more favorable for growth stocks. And, you know, long story short, rising rates means the the growthy part of growth, right? The the ability to grow earnings uh, is less attractive when rates are going higher is the way I would generally summarize that relationship. What's interesting, though, is if you look in the last uh, two months, you've really seen uh, rates stabilize, uh, right? You've seen rates come down. You've seen this ratio uh, stabilize. And while rates have come down, you're really not seeing growth outperform too dramatically. And I think that's going to be one of the real questions going into next year. Do you see rates continue higher? Do you see this ratio continue on to the upside? Or uh, is this disagreement uh, net out more to rates going lower and then this ratio starts to go down and all of a sudden growth starts to do a little bit better? I find that a possible scenario, but much less 
uh, much less likely. So at the end of the day, right, you see a lot of choppiness in, uh, in interest rates. If you look at the last couple of weeks, December, we've sort of been hovering right around that 350 level. I think going into next year is when you most likely see uh, a, 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 a change, sort of the next move. I wouldn't be surprised if that move is higher for uh, for the 10-year yield. Now, the other side of that, you sort of flip that chart over and you get a chart of something like the ag. There are a couple of ETFs we tend to track, ag, uh, which is uh, sort of aggregate corporate and treasury bonds together. You have the TLT, uh, which is uh, treasury bonds or long treasury bonds. And then, uh, and then the LQD is corporate bonds. You know, when you're looking at the chart of the ag, this bullish momentum divergence here in October, I think was pretty telling. Uh, that's what suggested rates have probably hit a peak for now because bond prices were bottoming out. You, that's certainly been the case. Now look how the ag is testing its 200 day. The S&P 500 is testing its own 200 day. So far has failed to really follow through above it. The ag actually has not closed above its 200 day. It's tested it a couple of times, but finding resistance there. So you have a situation where stocks and bonds are both testing a key moving average. I think today, when I think, you know, wrapping up this segment on don't fight the Fed, I think there was a scenario where today really resolved to the upside. And Powell's comments gave a lot of bulls a lot more fuel for a bullish fire to propel stocks and bonds higher to have a very risk on feel to the end of the trading day today, which would mean S&P 4300 becomes a very reasonable, if not very expected target. I didn't see that today. I saw stocks uh, coming off uh, after uh, after their uh, highs earlier in the day. I saw bonds really not falling through to the upside as rates uh, you know, sort of chopped around a, a little bit on their own. So in terms of a broad, uh, you know, uh, sort of short term signal, I don't know if we got it. I saw a lot of noise, but not a lot of directional sense, which means I think the market's right back where we started, which is facing the prospect of rates sort of uh, continuing higher in the new year. Let us wrap the show. We've got to wrap it up. The three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. And here is chart number one in our segment, don't fight the Fed. We talked about this chart, the ag, right? And there are a number of ETFs that we track. We usually bring up the TLT, but I thought the ag was an interesting one because of where it uh, where it is right now relative to a key resistance level, the 200-day moving average. And again, what's important about that moving average is so many people focus on it. And what, I, from my experience, even investors, institutional investors that are not chart people, but have a chart up at some point, it has the 200-day. And the trading desks all know when something's hitting the 200-day because they tend to be much more technically oriented. So it's concerning to me that we are hitting the 200-day. It's concerning to me also that the RSI became overbought a couple of days ago and now coming out of that overbought range. That could indicate an upside exhaustion and maybe the end of this rally phase for bonds off of the low in October. We'll see how the next week or two plays out, but that is chart number one. Chart number two, is looking at the VIX. I worked up this candle chart just to show you the traditional relationship in general. When the S&P, which is in the bottom half in blue, when the S&P moves higher, the VIX tends to move lower. On the other hand, when the S&P S is moving uh, downwards, like these uh, two days, uh, December 5th and 6th, you see volatility tends to increase. And that's because I think just the behavioral aspects of what happens, right? When people are optimistic, they sort of slowly accumulate things. When people panic, they sort of uh, panic and sell everything. And as a result, volatility increases in down phases and decreases in up phases. Look at how that has changed, though, in the last three trading sessions. The last three trading sessions, the S&P and the VIX have moved in the same direction. What that means is the market's have actually moving lower and the volatility is coming in. One of these is going to go back to its normal range, which I would argue it's either volatility starts to increase to recognize that people start panicking when they realize the the, the move is not going to happen on stocks, or we start to see a, uh, a breakout in the S&P. Finally, let us finish the show on a, on a strong note, on a positive note, if we can. Pfizer, making a new swing high today, getting about 54, up 2.7%. Healthcare, the top performing sector today, and overall, one of the best relative performing sectors recently. Look at the improvement in relative strength in Pfizer in the last uh, the last month or two. We'll see if that can continue. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Special thanks to Sam Burns from Mill Street Research in Boston. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.